Hi, everyone, and welcome to our 10th COVID Community Town Hall, sponsored by the Stanford School of Medicine, um, the Office of Community Engagement here, as well as the Department of Epidemiology and Population Health. My name is Lisa Goldman Rosas. I'm an assistant professor here in the Department of Epidemiology and Population Health um, and the director of the School of Medicine Office of Community Engagement. And as always, I am so excited uh, for today and to be your moderator. Okay, let's go to the next slide. All right. Como siempre, antes de empezar, bienvenidos a todos que nos están escuchando en español. Qué bueno que nos hayan acompañado el día de hoy. Y como siempre, gracias a Claudia y Esperanza que están haciendo la interpretación de uh, hoy. Uh, si quieren escuchar en español, favor de hacer clic aquí abajo, donde ven, donde dice Interpretation. Ok, muy bien. Next. So today is a, um, an important day for many in our community. And before we start, we wanted to take an opportunity to express our condolences to the victims and their families of the tragedy at the Santa Clara County VTA mass shooting yesterday. Um, we also wanted, uh, maybe like some of us, if you're looking for ways to support our partners at Working Partnership USA in San Jose are collecting donations to support the victims and their families. And I think one of my team members is going to uh, drop the link in the chat. So if you want to make a donation, of course, um, you have the opportunity. And again, um, our thoughts and prayers are with all the victims, their loved ones and, and families and the whole VTA community. OK, next slide, please. Okay, so for today's town hall, again, this is our 10th one, and it's been a real honor to be with you over these um, last uh, 10 months. We have the good fortune of welcoming back two of our previous panelists, um, and we also have two new panelists joining us that I'll introduce in just a minute. Today, we're going to talk about new hot topics, like always. So, um, things that are emerging for the COVID-19 pandemic. We're of course gonna talk about um, vaccines. This time we'll focus more on vaccines for children as those are becoming available. We're gonna talk about these confusing new mask um, recommendations. And we'll also talk about vaccine variants. Um, and then most importantly, we wanna address any issues you have um, and you can indicate those to us by putting your questions in the Q&A. Our goal is always to provide evidence and the, the latest scientific information on topics that matter to you. So please go ahead and submit those questions. Y como siempre, si quieren poner eh, preguntas en español, adelante. All right. Um, and then we will also put a survey in the chat. Um, since we've been doing these town halls now for over a year, we would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, so we'll put the link to the survey in the chat or the Q&A as well. Um, and please take some time to let us know what you think about these town halls. Okay, so without further ado, I think it is time to introduce the panelists that we have today. Wonderful. So we have four uh, speakers. We have two here from Stanford and two community partners. So first you will get the honor of hearing from Dr. Maldonado. Uh, Dr. Maldonado holds many roles here at our university. She's a Senior Associate Dean for Faculty Development and Diversity. Um, she's also a Professor of um, Pediatric Infectious Disease. She's also in my Department of Epidemiology and Population Health, and we're really proud about that. Um, and she holds many roles in the hospital as well. Uh, we'll also have Dr. Hector Bonilla. He's an Associate Professor of Medicine and Infectious Disease here at Stanford. And then our two community uh, panelists. First, we have Dr. Neil Patel. Um, he is a pediatrician, uh, the lead of the San Carlos Pediatrics at Sutter Health Palo Alto Medical Foundation. And he also holds several other important roles such as commissioner for first five of San Mateo County and the American Academy of Pediatrics member at large for San Mateo as well as others. And then we are welcoming back Nancy McGee. She is the San Mateo County Superintendent of Schools. Um, and always happy to answer many of parents' questions um, about schools and, and how we're operating during the, the COVID pandemic. Now, for those of you who have attended our town halls in the past, you know that I ask each speaker to share something personal about themselves. 
um, so that we can get to know them a little bit better. So for today, the question I'm going to ask each speaker is Gavin, <laughs> Gavin Newsom announced um, that he has a new program for incentivizing vaccines, and he's going to give $50 grocery uh, gift cards to people 12 and over who get their vaccine. So what I want to know from each panelist is <laughs> how would you spend your $50 at the grocery store? And I always go first um, so that you have some time to think of how you would spend it. And so since it's been getting hot, I would spend all my $50 on popsicles because those are some of my favorite things to eat. <laughs> so um, Bonnie, I hope you have an idea of how to spend your $50 at the grocery store because you are up next. Oh, absolutely. I have without question. Number one, <laughs> Rocky Road ice cream and number two, Tin Pot ice cream because they don't have Rocky Road. <laughs> and number good. three i'd have to run um, uh, twice as much as i do <laughs> but it would be worth it <laughs> well we can get together with our popsicles and ice cream okay great so uh dr maldonado you are up first and i'll let you share your screen with your slides okay thank you lisa and thank you for inviting me to this town hall it's always a pleasure and an honor to be here with all of you um i am really proud of Lisa and all the work that she's been doing uh, uh, with the community Office of Community Engagement and all her other work. She is very humble, but she's done quite a lot of work. And also to the OCE in general for the efforts that they've made and to our community partners for really working with us to uh, make this county um, really um, what it's been so far. That is, we've done such a great job in dealing with this horrible, horrible disease. So I'm going to talk about some specific issues. I, I'm going to talk about uh, the vaccines. Um, and uh, I'm going to spend a lot of time at the beginning, just I'm going to talk about 10 minutes. So just about 10 minutes. But I want to talk about general pediatric vaccinations that aren't about COVID, because that's a big concern. But then at the end, I'm going to talk about masks. And there's a lot of details in there, because it is confusing. I just want to lay it out so you can see it, and um, we can talk. We can talk through the different points, just so you can understand uh, what the current guidance looks like. So let me go to the next slide. So just for disclosure, I am the member of a data safety monitoring board for a Pfizer non-COVID vaccine trial, and I'm also the site principal investigator here at Stanford for the Pfizer. COVID-19 pediatric vaccine trials for children under 12. So let's talk first about the COVID-19 impact on general pediatric immunizations and well child visits. And I know Dr. Patel knows this better than I because he does a lot of this work and I'm really excited to hear what he has to say. But I'm also the chair of the Committee on Infectious Diseases for the American Academy of Pediatrics. We published something called the Red Book and actually our Red Book just got released yesterday. So we're really excited. And we're proud to say that the Red Book, uh, which is the book that guides pediatricians on infectious diseases and vaccines, was published only about three weeks uh, with a three week delay, despite the fact that we had to do it through the pandemic and a massive paper shortage for unknown reasons. So um, yeah, so we're very happy about that. And if you know your pediatrician um, well enough, you should ask them to get the new version of the 2021 Red Book because it's ready. So let's just talk about the need for catch-up vaccinations. And these are data that I was allowed to share from the CDC, from the Centers for Disease Control. And we know that many people um, were uh, obviously in lockdown in the last year. And starting on March 17th or 20th, depending on whether you were in the Bay Area or outside of California, um, people just were not going out and pediatricians and practitioners in general were having a hard time figuring out whether they should be going, uh, having people come into their offices or not. And we saw a huge reduction in regular, healthy, well child visits, as well as sick visits uh, for adults and children. But uh, the data have demonstrated that there is between an 11 and 23% reduction still this year overall. When you go back to last year and compare where we are, we're still missing a lot of vaccinations for kids. And because adolescents are hard to reach in general anyway, because of 
uh, crowded schedules and in a hard time, harder time to bring older kids back in for follow-up. The biggest gaps, and you'll see them in a bit, are in the 11 to 12 year old age group. And schools are so overwhelmed, they may not be able to focus on vaccination compliance requirements, even though they are required, they may not be able to keep up to date with those. So we're really worried about that because we are concerned that there could be outbreaks of other diseases like measles or pertussis. And we don't know when the vaccines will be available for the younger children, but we know they're available for the 12 year olds and older. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about a co-administration of vaccines. So we really, but the message is here, we need to have our children caught up to their current vaccines. So pneumococcal vaccine, rotavirus, um, uh, DTaP, uh, measles, mumps, rubella, all of the other vaccines, HPV, they need to be caught up on those too because those diseases are still around and they can still get sick uh, from those other diseases as well. Now, this is a little messy, but I just goes to show you from the last year, you can see that the Vaccines for Children organization, that is the organization at the federal government that provides funding to public health clinics and public serving providers um, for vaccine uh, orders. So they provide the vaccines for free for people who can't afford to pay for them. And you can see that from last year um, in the blue and today, this, this year in the orange, that when you look at the number of vaccines, um, they actually um, were still below, the, the orange bars are lower than the blue bar. So we actually are seeing big gaps and we especially saw big gaps back here in March and April, um, but we're still seeing some gaps in flu in vaccines uh, for children, not COVID vaccines, but the other vaccines for children. This slide shows in the green bar, all vaccines except for the flu vaccine in children over time. And the blue bar, the blue line shows measles vaccines. And you can see we're way below where we need to be this year compared to where we were before the pandemic. At, by, as of April 18th, overall, the public clinics are, have distributed less uh, 11.3 million less doses than they did a year ago overall in the last year. And 1.5 million of those doses are measles vaccines. Now, some people have said, well, in the private clinics are doing better and they are doing better but they are not back to normal either. So everyone needs to make sure that their children are fully vaccinated. And this is a slide showing the number of missed well visits um, by the age of the child. And you can see that um, mostly when you get up to the 15 month old visit that most kids are up to date, but when you start to get over 15 months of age um, and especially when you get over five years of age, there's a lot of missed visits. Over 15% of children have missed visits. Um, and then the gap for some pediatric vaccines is larger than others. We're down about five to 10% for rotavirus, Prevnar and DTaP vaccines. Um, and then for the, for the adolescent vaccines, we're down 15 to 20%. So that's a big problem because that means that those diseases can be spread among children when they get back together for school. Um, we also know that influenza coverage is lower in the yellow bars. Um, for, uh, compare in the blue bars for this year compared to the yellow bars from last year. And on the left, you see uh, immunizations for black non-Hispanic children. And then in the next one bar, the next grouping is Latinx kids. And then the next is white and other, and other kids. You see that for black and Hispanic children, we're seeing lower immunization rates overall for flu, um, even this last year and this year. So really need to make sure those kids get vaccinated. And then the number of missed well visits is much higher for black and Latinx children compared to white children as well. So um, why do we give these vaccines? Well, worldwide, more than a billion people have received vaccines, COVID vaccines. And in the US, almost 300 million doses have been given. That's a lot of vaccines. These are more vaccines than we've given uh, for any disease uh, in, in the last uh, several decades. And so, um, these are very well studied, very safe and effective, and we know that about 4 million children in the U.S. have received a COVID-19 vaccine. Most of those are over 16, 16 and older. This is just a slide. It's very busy, but um, we'll be posting these, so you'll have these available. 
these are just the vaccines that are being studied and the different age groups. And what I wanted to point out is that we know that the Pfizer vaccine here has already been approved for 12 year olds and over. Moderna will be submitting their data for 12 year olds and over as well. And the other vaccines the J&J &J and others are, are doing trials in teenagers as well. Now for children under 12, those studies are still ongoing. And it's likely that we'll see a vaccine for 12, uh, for, for five to 12 year olds, hopefully by this fall, at least from Pfizer. And for kids under five, probably uh, not till winter or maybe the beginning of 2022. This is data showing that there have been about, through, uh, at this time when this slide came out, about 297 children had died from COVID, but now it's somewhere between three and 600 children. And if you look at the top 10 causes of death in children overall in 2019, that's before COVID, you can see that the number of those top 10 deaths, uh, the number of COVID deaths is equal, is at least as high as the 10th most common cause of death in both of these, in both CDC data and general data from uh, vital statistics. So we know that um, COVID is in the top 10 or 11 most common causes of death in children. Even though the absolute numbers are small compared to adults, they're still very high for children because we don't generally want to see anybody die, but especially children should not be dying at this young age. So it is affecting our children. And we know that the uh, federal government and, and bioethicists have ruled that um, they reviewed the data and they do think that enrolling children in COVID vaccine trials is safe and effective. And the American Academy of Pediatrics had put out a letter as well to the federal government saying that they wanted children to be engaged in safe and safe clinical trials, which they have been, so we can get vaccines out to all children as quickly as we can in a safe way. We also know that over 40,000 children in the U.S. have lost a parent to COVID-19. And um, here you see the deaths, the, the parents who died for the zero to 17 year olds. Um, and this disproportionately affects black and Latinx children. And finally, um, why we need vaccines in this age group, children also make up about a quarter of the US population and we're going to need not only to protect them, but to protect their family members and their community members. So if since they make up such a big proportion of the US population, we need to vaccinate as many of our overall population, including children, to keep transmission uh, down and to keep the virus from spreading. Now let's talk about masking. So I just wanna make a point overall, this is all based on CDC information. Masking is only one part of a strategy in addition to distancing, hand washing and vaccination to reduce the risk of COVID-19. So pediatricians should be talking to their patients and families. So you should talk to your provider, either in a public or private clinic, because they will have all this information. This is information that's put out by the American Academy of Pediatrics in collaboration with the Centers for Disease Control. So wear, wear your mask, um, but CDC also says wear your mask in certain conditions, but the CDC now says that masks and distancing are not needed anymore if you're fully vaccinated in certain conditions, especially outdoors and when there aren't big crowds. But you need to check with your local um, county health department to see what their regulations are because the federal government can only make recommendations, but the actual uh, regulation occurs at the county or the state level. And schools, childcare programs, and camps are encouraged to continue to support masking for children and staff until the vaccine is available for all children. Now, um, you need to use a correct and consistent, well-fitting mask for those who are not fully vaccinated. It should fit over the mouth and nose, snugly on the face without any gaps. And face masks can and should be worn by children two years of age and older. Uh, even those with underlying health conditions, unless there is a specific medical exemption that from their pediatrician. Uh, we know that children can wear masks and are comfortable with them. They can reduce the spread of not just SARS-CoV-2, but other viruses as well. We saw uh, very little spread of disease with mask wearing this year. 
And home use of face masks may be helpful when there are people who are uh, in the family who are uh, medically fragile, who have other health conditions, for example, and who may have high risk for complications of infection. And they should be continued until the child is considered fully vaccinated, which is defined as two weeks after they've been given their final dose. So the second dose of Pfizer or Moderna and the, the one dose of Johnson & Johnson. So a, a mask is not the only thing. Remember, you should really continue to distance at least three feet in schools and six feet elsewhere until that guidance is lifted at the national level for vaccinated people. For those who aren't vaccinated, masks should still be worn around people who don't live in your household. If you don't know somebody and they're walking around without a mask, you don't really know if they're really vaccinated or not. And we're not really asking people to ask each other because that is not really, uh, may not be uh, appropriate. Some people may not wanna give that information out. So masks should be used outdoors for those who are unvaccinated if they're in large group settings or if recommendations for physical distancing can't be maintained. And um, public health masking may vary based on how much virus there is in your community. So you really need to check again with your city or your county and see what the guidelines will be. Because right now things are great, but in the next month or two or three, things could change. So you need to keep checking. Now, um, Mask use should be continued for unvaccinated people when playing indoor sports, except for those where masks may become a hazard, for example, swimming and outdoor sports that have very close contact. And masks can be worn anytime, must be worn anytime you are traveling on a plane, bus, train, or other form of public transportation. Um, people who are immunocompromised may not respond well to the vaccine, they may not get a good immune response. So they need to be extra careful because they may not actually be protected. And we know that the companies, the vaccine companies are doing studies right now to see how they can uh, help those immunocompromised people um, maybe respond to say a third dose of a vaccine. So studies are going on now, but until then, people who have immunocompromised conditions that is on chemotherapy or other drugs like steroids, et cetera, they may need uh, to still be careful because they may actually not have developed a good immune response. So if you have somebody in your house who is sick with COVID or has tested positive recently, you should be wearing your mask in, if you live in, that, in the home with that person. And when you wash your hands with soap and water, you need to wash for at least 20 seconds and you know wash in between your fingers um, very well. Um, or you can use hand sanitizer, especially after touching or removing your mask. And that's all I have today. We'll be posting these references for your use. And um, I'd like to stop there and uh, move on um, back to Lisa. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Maldonado. It's always a pleasure to get your uh, information. Thank you for synthesizing all the mask guidance. And thank you so much for talking about the importance of not just COVID vaccines for children, but all vaccines uh, for children. Really appreciate that. Okay, we're moving on to our second panelist. Our second panelist is Dr. Hector Bonilla. Welcome. And um, as with each panelist, before you get started, Dr. Bonilla, I would love to know if you got a $50 grocery gift card from Gavin Newsom for getting your vaccine, how would you spend that grocery gift card? I give it to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> you know how to spend this thing better than me. So. Okay. Right. Now we know the roles and responsibilities in your house. Okay. Wonderful. Let, uh, let me, I going to share my screen with you. Perfect, um, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So I, I going to talk to variants and, and uh, to be like a kind of, to the levels of the people they can understand. Uh, the virus uh, appear, uh, I am a professor, associate professor of the infection diseases in the Division of Infection Diseases. I have been involved in the um, a clinical trials looking for uh, therapeutics for treatment of COVID. 
and still in a search to try to find out the uh, best drugs. And, a, and recently I get involved in what happened after COVID uh, with the people uh, getting infected and what kind of sequela we see in this kind of population. Maybe at the end of the discussion, maybe we can talk about this kind of problem because it's uh, the things I've seen in the clinic have been devastated situations. I have no disclosures. So when we were talking about variants, you have to understand those viruses are RNA viruses, uh, uh, the coronavirus, and those viruses, they multiply. And when the virus multiply, sometimes makes some mistakes. And when they the mistake, the virus could be, virus to be, most of the time the virus decay and not survive. Other virus maintain, but other virus, they are stronger and can emerge. And there are some strain they can be predominant in different populations. And this happened because the virus multiplied. So one of the problem is humans. Humans are the appropriate reservoir where the virus multiply and the changes can happen in the humans or in the nature. And from there, this can all be adapted to different kind of humans, like a possible have been proposed this virus uh, appearing in animals and for the animals, some mutations and possible do some changes that then adapt into the humans and, and this way cause infections and the infections could be spread in the, according to what kind of mutation they have. So with the virus change, so people start tracking and see what changes the virus make. Because remember, the virus are like a, a, like a change, every single piece represent one component of the virus. And those kind of pieces of the chains can change. And when those changes happen, could be emergency a new particular type or strain of the virus. And those kind of strains of the virus have been classified. For example, in the beginning in Wuhan, when, the, when we had the initial cases, those strains rapidly, they change for a, a new strains they call 6114, and this strain was the one to disseminate for Europe in, in Italy, and then for whole Europe, and then around the world, this strain appeared. Subsequently, this strain was replaced by a new strain that emerged in UK. They call the B117. We call the UK strain for the people they know. Uh, this strain uh, have been shown is a different than the other one, the transmission is going to be higher and found out this kind of strain multiply at uh, higher rates in the epithelium of the airway in the upper and lower airway and possible have been associated with the highest mortality. Uh, this strain start in, in, in UK, then spread to whole Europe and came with a second wave. And then the strain later on came to the East Coast and from the East Coast is like a, we have in the United States. Subsequently, another strains appear in, in South Africa and this strain have been completely different, have been in front of these more infections and possible associated with highest mortality. And because the virus mutate and change, so new strains appear in different kind of countries. In Brazil have been uh, found out two strains, they call the P1 and P2. Uh, and they found out in, the, in Brazil, they have a two outbreaks. The first initial outbreak possibly related with a 6114. And subsequently, a new strain appeared at the P1 and P2. And uh, they are the first cases of possible uh, reinfection have been reported with a new strain of the virus. And subsequently here in uh, in California, so we started seeing our own strain. Uh, they call the B1427. Then this mutation, they call 452. And these mutations have been associated possibly with more infectivity uh, compared with all strains. Uh, more recently now in India, I think the virus keep on multiplying in India is like a kind of uh, a combination of the strain from the uh, South Africa and the, and the strain of California. So this kind of hybrid is the one to cause infections in India. We don't know too much information about it's associated with highest mortality or, trans, or transmission. 
So what we know about those strengths, and in conclusion, we honor the UK as well as the South Africa strain, they are increased transmission of this strain compared with the other ones. So in some way, I like a more fit, able to cause more infection to humans, able to multiply more, and possible, you know, well documented, increase the mortality and complications of, of in people getting infected with the strain. The one we have here in California have been shown the effectivity increased by 20% and possible the Brazilian increase again, the transmission by snow uh, and of data try to conclude. What happened in the country and over the time, if we compare here in these graphics, we have from January to April, the, what they had evolution. If you see initially, we have the, uh, our strain, the C 6114, and later on, what replaced by, by the B117 in the UK strain. And over the time, it was the more predominant, predominant strain in the same one we have at this point. If we look at the map in the country, try to look for in different regions of the country, we see in this one, the B117, the UK strain, is still the predominant in the whole regions along the country. Um, a follow for uh, strains from a, a, the B133 and the P1 from Brazil. Uh, for a few cases have been reported already for a strain from India and the United States, but still they are not the prominent strains at this moment. So what happened here in Stanford? In Stanford, we have been collecting over 5,000 uh, samples and have this, uh, the adults have been, the whole genome was sequencing and they have been screened for different kind of mutations. If they are positive, they go to a, a set up a one lineage we have a, here in the Bay Area. And we see uh, the UK is the more predominant strain uh, follow at the lower rates from the a, a, South Africa, Brazilians, and, and the California strain is still one of the more premium strains here in the area. So um, here is what happened here in our strains here. We have here in orange is our California strain, like in February was the more premium strain, but over the time we see start declining, have been uh, replaced for the, the uh, a UK strain, like it was lower and over the time, the green have been increased. And recently we see the number of cases have been declined. And here in the same way we can put in here, a, we have in initially California, the California strain, the uh, L452, L452R strain, that predominant over the time have been declining. And now we see one increase in the uh, UK, but overall we see the whole tendency in California as well as the whole country in decline the numbers of um, infections as well as decrease hospitalizations and mortality. Thanks for the people uh, vaccination programs. I think I have my 10 minutes already, good. Any questions? Thank so you so much, about... Dr. Bonilla. We're going to have, uh, there are lots of questions for you and we're okay. going to let each panelist go and then I'm going to um, send the, I'll, I'll ask the questions for you to answer after, but thank you okay. so much. So let me make a few, maybe few words oh, about, sure. about the post-COVID. So sure. we started interesting since the beginning and what happened after the people recovered from the acute infection, even be people being in the hospital or people with a mild disease. We see around maybe a 30% of the population has some any symptoms that persist even months after the initial infections. And the complications could be from a respiratory complications like a pulmonary fibrosis and a few people they need a lung transplant or a brain complication that include from a stroke and a brain fog or problems with the cognitions in this kind of populations, then 
limit them to have the normal functions, or in some patients we see uh, a, a, a infection that damage the heart, that lead into a cardiac dysfunction in the people present with a chest pain, irregular heartbeat, and, and possible lead to heart failures. So it's, it's very important to, uh, we have a follow-up from this population of the infection. And look like at the severity of the disease doesn't mean you're going to have a symptoms or not. We see people with a very mild disease that end up with having some complications. So it's one of the ways to prevent this kind of potential long-term complication could be the use of vaccination to prevent infections. And the other way is try to uh, find drugs able to treat the acute infection, try to prevent the de development of sequelas of this illness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bonilla. And there definitely are lots of questions for you. So we will get to them um, as soon as we can. And thank you to all the attendees who are submitting such great questions. We are noting them and, and getting ready to ask the panelists. Okay, uh, let's turn it over to Dr. Patel. Um, and Dr. Patel, don't forget to share with us how you're gonna spend your $50 um, grocery uh, uh, gift card. And Dr. Bonilla, if you can stop sharing, I think um, Dr. Patel can share. Or let me see if I can get my slides up. Um, share screen. Give me just a sec. Let's see, I think I'm showing it. We can see your slides, perfect. Great. Okay. Um, so if I, I, for this one, this would be easy for me. My $50 would go, it's my son's birth, older son's birthday tomorrow. So I would buy birthday cake and um, some Oreos and ice cream. That's what's popular with the kids. Um, so that's what I would buy. And uh, I want to thank Dr. Maldonado and let you know that my red book is already ordered. Um, I really appreciate uh, uh, and we use that I use it often, almost daily, if you will. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone, to all. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to discuss the COVID vaccine and the health of children during this COVID pandemic. Thank you for having me to the OCE office. Um, buenas tardes a todos y muchas gracias por darme la oportunidad de discutir temas acerca de la vacuna del COVID y sobre la salud de los niños en esta época de COVID. Mucho gusto. All right, so I'm gonna get started. Uh, I also have no disclosures. Um, the objectives that I have today is to, uh, I'm so glad that Dr. Maldonado expressed the, the importance of uh, uh, getting the, uh, our regular vaccines, uh, which is what I do in clinic um, every, every day that I work. Um, but I also wanted to, and also the importance of getting the COVID vaccine. Um, my same same son whose birthday is tomorrow uh, was very excited and got the COVID vaccine and we were really excited. It was a family event. Um, but the objectives for today are to um, uh, talk a little bit about what's going on with the COVID or what parents have been asking me in clinic, um, uh, which sort of leads to a little discussion on vaccine hesitancy. Um, where can you actually get the vaccine? Um, and some considerations about um, children as they go back to school um, after being home due to the pandemic. Um, so, you know, parent interest in COVID vaccine we found has uh, been uh, sort of in three buckets. One is uh, people like my family, my son was, yes, we want the vaccine right away. And then there are so our uh, families where they want to watch and wait for a little bit. And then there's this, another third that, uh, uh, that are not that interested and, and say, no, thank you. Um, this, when you have you know, uh, the in between this little group right here, it's the hardest to sometimes to reach them. Uh, but we've sort of noticed that this is a pattern in uh, how parents are thinking about the vaccine. Um, this is uh, from the Kaiser Family Foundation. And it basically just sort of, sort of shows the same thing that 29% of all parents would want to get their kids vaccinated right away. There's a second set that wants to wait and see how it'll work. And then there's a third set that either would only give the vaccine if it was required or just definitely are not interested. 
Uh, and then it leads to a, 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 a conversation about why would someone be hesitant about the vaccine? And there's sort of three ways to think about this, especially if you're talking uh, to uh, somebody who is hesitant about a vaccine, and this could be your friend, this could be if you're uh, physicians, it could be um, uh, your patients, uh, it could be if you're educators, it could be parents. Um, uh, but uh, the first thing is confidence, right? Mm -hmm. So if there is a trust in the, if, if there is no trust in the effectiveness or uh, safety of a vaccine, then your confidence in the vaccine is undermined. Um, sometimes it has to do with motives of those who um, establish the policies. And we've sort of found that, you know, uh, political party sometimes affects this um, and leads towards a, a lack of or a lot of confidence. Uh, the second bucket here below on, on, the, on this side is complacency. So if you don't think that COVID is that big of a deal in kids, and Dr. Maldonado has stated her case about why COVID is important, even in the in the in the children pop in the child population, uh, then you may be hesitant about giving the vaccine if you don't really think that it's preventing an illness that that is that is that or that it's needed. And then the third thing is convenience. If you do, you know, we we do know that um, surprisingly the COVID vaccine, uh, it, we know that it's free, but there are people who are concerned about how much it costs, and so. Um, we want to help educate people. And the, of course, there are supposed to be vaccines now available in terms of access near where you live. But if you can't drive or if you have to walk to get the vaccine, then it may um, not be as convenient. So these are some of the things that we think about uh, how you may want to when you're trying to convince somebody to get the vaccine. So this is what parents have been saying to me over the past couple of weeks. Um, that, the, you know, and when they're concerned about it. I mean, if they want the vaccine and they're part of that vaccine, that's, I want it right now, that's really great. But um, we also want to be really respectful to, to families and parents for the concerns that they may have about was it developed too fast? Um, will it affect hormones or puberty or fertility? That is still something that does definitely come up. Um, another thing that's really common, so we know in, in clinic that food allergies are, are really common. And so a lot of families have questions about food allergies and whether it'll cause the, whether the vaccine will cause a reaction. Um, is it worth it? As we mentioned, is it worth it for vaccines? If it's not that bad, then do we really need to take the risk with the new vaccine? Um, there are some families who are saying, well, we sheltered in place for a year and had no problem. We'll just keep sheltering in place. We don't really need, think we need the vaccine. Um, and the last thing I put there was they do ask, well, what do you think? And I think when somebody asks you, well, what do you think? It's your opportunity to share uh, what, you, what you feel and, and then sort of take the right approach um, to help convince them. So this comes straight from the CDC. The CDC has a beautiful slide or a, a, a discussion about how to talk to, to family and friends. And again, this doesn't have to be physicians. It could be friends, family, coworkers. Um, if you're in a conversation. And one thing is to really be, um, to be empathic. We need to listen to people and have a discussion with them and talk to them um, and understand and, and support their concern. Um, to ask open-ended questions. Um, and then a lot of times, even for me, it's easy to go to the science, but sometimes science is not what people need. And so I think it's helpful to ask people for permission to share lots of facts and because that may not be what, you know, some people know that it's actually a good thing but still are afraid or don't want it. Um, help them find their own reasons to get vaccinated. Um, and that could range different things. Of course, for a lot of us, our family is really important and keeping our family members safe, especially the um, uh, uh, elders in our families uh, and very young ones in our families. Uh, it could be a really great reason if you can get people to, under, to, to, to go there. Um, what I also like to say is to encourage them to talk to people they trust. Often, sometimes that's the pediatrician or um, maybe somebody uh, 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 in the community that, that, the, that an individual may be uh, connected to. And my favorite one here is to ask your own child for their opinion, sometimes, especially with the teenagers and the, young, and, um, the, the 12 to 15 group. They have some really interesting things to say and how they, how they want it. 
and really are able to articulate, articulate quite nicely why they want the vaccine, even though that may not be something that the adult thinks. And then this last thing is here is, you know, it says the same thing that there's a range of hesitancy. You know, not everybody is like, I don't want it or I want it. But, you know, there's the no thank you, hesitant, watch and wait, agreeable, and yes, right away. And so when I'm talking to someone, I try to figure out, well, where do they fall on the spectrum? And you just, my goal is just to move them one step over because you don't want to overwhelm people um, necessarily. Um, so that's my uh, sort of uh, conclusion about a vaccine hesitancy. On the flip side, if somebody's really interested, a lot of questions I'm getting is, well, for the 12 to 15 year olds, how can I, where can I get my vaccine? Um, and so this may be stuff that people know already, but one thing is check with your pediatrician's website or your physician's website or app. Um, and my turn still works uh, and actually has a lot of places and is a good way to connect to the pharmacies. Um, but another good way is the school districts. A lot of school districts are partnering with organizations or pharmacies to bring vaccine to the school and it makes it really convenient uh, to get the vaccine. And then also to check the San Mateo and Santa Clara County websites. Uh, where it's the best place for walk-in clinics. So, you know, don't think that a, a need for an appointment is necessarily a barrier. You, if you don't have an appointment, there's a lot of places where you can walk in um, or they have pop-up clinics. Uh, I wanna transition, and, and this is my final uh, uh, portion, is to really talk, talk to, about, talk to uh, everyone about how we can support our kids as they go back to school um, and transition in person. Uh, so, you know, in the preschool age, uh, preschoolers are really joyful and, na and naturally open to new things. So, um, and they do really well with masks, but you can practice with masks. You can, um, and for children, uh, we get a lot of concern about socialization because some, some kids haven't seen anybody for a long time. Um, so reintroduce the park play date. We um, fortunately have uh, good weather now at this point. Um, and expand your bubble to include children uh, if you don't have a lot of children uh, uh, in your family or a bubble up until now. Uh, remember that play is parallel. So kids in the preschool age are not, we're not trying to get them to, you know, play complex games together, but just by being around each other, they are learning, but they may not play with each other specifically. And always um, reading to them is, is helpful. Um, uh, especially as they develop their speech um, and, and continue to, uh, to support opportunities for free play and to really work with their hands. Uh, for the transition for elementary school, uh, transition, um, so this group, right, is sometimes has lost their order of the task of doing things. So, uh, Things that are important for them is to try, and they've been doing a lot of screen, even you know, in the elementary school age. And so, there is this difference between like engaging with the screen versus engaging with a live person. And um, these slides were actually developed. I got this information through um, uh, an educator. And so, we want to help convert those blank stares against a screen to actually interact with, with people. Um, students, they need to rebuild their stamina. So these you know, kids are used to going to get some, a break, um, maybe do their screen, do their, their distance learning lying down. Um, so they need stamina uh, to, and routine in order to uh, attend school. They need those routines of order about how to get out of the house, brushing their teeth, getting dressed, um, eating breakfast, um, and maybe even start to sit at a desk, especially if they have not gone, if they're still home and not, and not in hybrid, about how to sort of sit still for a, a some amount of time, which means a communicating house rules. Um, reintroduce social interactions um, with friends and family, uh, and also have them practice wearing masks. Um, and acknowledge that there is already an element of social anxiety with return to school. So, you know, some of these kids, it may be that they are worried or um, uh, have, anxiety as well about going to school and to really help talk them through it. Um, the last thing is middle and high school. So, you know, the thing I think about middle school and high school is that they're really eager to go back. They have want to do a lot. Um, they often tend to want to be social, but there's also this other side of many students who maybe were social have become more introverted due to extra screen time, gaming and, uh, and binge watching of shows. Um, they're usually energetic, but they may not have the energy and they may need to introduce some stamina or re, re, um, 
redevelop their stamina as well. So introducing social interactions with peers in relaxed and structured settings. So sometimes it might be really, you know, teenagers may just want to hang out, but they also need to spend time actually doing structured activity. Um, and maybe it would be great over the summer to, inter to reincorporate that. Um, there's a di and differentiate between screen related pastime and the activities that bring them joy. You know, what comes to mind is my son would do PE in front of the screen, but it's different when you do PE with, um, lot, uh, with other students. Um, and of course, en encourage reading. Um, my, I think this is close to my last slide. So I wanna talk a little bit about reprogramming our children. I think you know the American Academy of Pediatrics used to recommend no more than two hours. Many people who go to their doctor's visits are probably familiar with that. But you know that the screen time has increased to six to 10 hours. Um, when you include the non-academic time, people are doing all kinds of activities on the screen as well sometimes. And so some middle, and the, this is a, a thing that um, is a little, you know, gives pause that you know some middle school and high schoolers, especially when, when uh, children who are new to their school have developed relationships entirely online through gaming and, uh, and social media and school. So it's, you can't ask those, those people, those, those kids to just forget about that. Um, uh, and not much is known about how relationships, you know, will uh, go forward um, online. And this could lead to an element of social anxiety. Ways to help this for a family sort of practically is survey the number of hours that, you know, really, that your child um, is actually on and then try to decrease it by small increments. And you can't go from six hours to two hours just like that. Um, if needed, use timers and work collaboratively with your child. Um, the AAP, American Academy of Pediatrics, on a site called healthychildren.org um, has a family media plan, which really works for especially the middle school aged children or uh, elementary and middle school aged children. And decipher online relationships um, and encourage in person relationships to offset because um, kids may want to hold on to some of their online relationships. And even though that's not ideal, perhaps for some of for parents, um, we want to basically we want to make sure that they um, don't feel cut off. Um, so survey social media as it's a special plug for social media like Instagram and that and that kind of stuff because they may be on a screen a lot more along with their school. Um, there have been reports about you know vision uh, right not being able to see or or dry eyes because of um, screens. So if you have a concern, please do get your vision checked. Um, and then a little bit of a check on, and I think to even myself, like audit your own adult use in the pandemic and how much, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a different conversation if you, we are still at home working from home and constantly on the screen, then it also frames the way we speak to our children. So last thing is that welcome uh, your children's questions. Uh, be, uh, you know, approach the questions uh, in a developmentally appropriate way, depending on how old they are. Um, don't avoid questions that you can't answer. You, we can, you can try to find the answers together or it's also okay to say that you don't know and that you're just gonna do the best you can um, uh, uh, as, you have, as you deal with difficult questions, especially about the pandemic and variants and things that, that children may bring up. Um, set the tone of positivity and be reassuring. The more you do that, uh, the more that it'll empower them to then go forward uh, as they get back into the real world. Um, and take cues from your child about how they're doing it so that if they are anxious, um, you can help them. There is this um, element of dealing with our own anxiety. So if we are anxious, then it, it's, I don't think it's that you have to deal with your our adult anxiety and then deal with the child's anxiety. You can work on it together. Um, focus, and one of the ways to do that is to focus on what has been successful so far. If you've been sheltering at home and sort of avoiding COVID, um, or you know people or you yourself had COVID before and, and you were doing uh, better uh, or recovered from it, those are positive things. Um, when we sit and uh, think about some of the uh, silver linings of, of the pandemic, this could be sort of the stepping stone to talking about things that are more difficult. And so my final thing is, is to keep talking. Thank you. Dr. Patel, that was incredibly useful. I have to say, as someone with a child transitioning to middle school, that was wonderful. And I also took a few tips for myself in transitioning back to the office. So that was that was wonderful. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. Our next panelist is Superintendent uh, Nancy McGee. Uh, we're really excited. Let me stop. To hear oh yeah, thank you. We're really excited to hear from you. 
And of course, we want to hear what you're going to spend your $50 grocery gift card on uh, while we let you pull up your, your um, slides. And while you're doing that, I'll just thank Dr. Maldonado for all your um, wonderful questions, your wonderful answer, answers to the questions that you posted. And for panelists, you can take a look at the questions that have been answered and, and learn a lot from those as well. All right, thank you so much. Go ahead and, oh, you had them and now they went away. There we go. There we go. Is that right? That's right, we got it. Um, so all $50, all every penny would go on fancy smelly cheese, as much as I can purchase. And it wouldn't be very much because <laughs> it's so expensive. Very good. Um, there we go. Okay, so I think my slides are showing, yes? We can see them perfectly. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach uh, since I am a, an educator, not from the medical community, but just kind of talk us through what the environment has been on school campuses, um, what we've been through, all that schools have navigated, and um, really encourage folks to understand that even um, prior to the vaccination, we've had students back in person learning and doing very, very well in person. Because in San Mateo County, we have a, uh, been observing, and I think this is true for most counties, observing sort of what we call the four pillars uh, of safe, um, safe schools uh, in COVID. Uh, lots and lots of um, energy and attention to hand washing and health and hygiene. Certainly wearing face coverings, observing physical distance, um, sorry, and, um, and limiting our gatherings. And um, we have had very, very little transfer of COVID in the school environments, very highly controlled. Um, everybody's got eyes on. And um, now with most of the adults and the older kids vaccinated, these school environments, um, um, should feel fairly stable and safe for families. So having said that, you know, what we want to focus on is making sure that everybody is getting exactly what they need when they need it. So all of our efforts to have students um, learning in school, learning in a hybrid model, and learning from home has been an effort to meet everybody where they are. Um, going into the new school year, this flexibility is going to be removed a little bit. The governor um, and the legislature are not going to support remote learning opportunities. So um, most families will need to find um, some kind of in-school community that feels comfortable to be in person. Um, anyway, as we've gone through the year, we've been successful in this way because there's so much support coming from around the community. We've had philanthropic funding um, for devices, and um, we've done more public Wi-Fi in San Mateo County to close that digital equity gap. Um, we've established with boys and girls clubs and other community-based organizations, these learning hubs. There's lots and lots of money coming from the governor and the new budget to continue this out of school learning time and learning hubs. Um, and uh, we've um, tried to support our child care and early learning community. Um, all these safeguards apply to them as well. So these are all the different ways in which we've partnered together to get to this bottom line of a safe return to in-person learning. Um, certainly 2020 and 21 have been presented additional challenges to schools, not just COVID. But um, we've had fire season, smoke days, um, racial injustice, uh, power shutoffs. So all kinds of things to, um, to manage. Um, and communities and parents may wonder, you know, why aren't schools opening? But they're managing uh, so much on the social, political, and local levels. So in August, um, the governor, uh, created the Roadmap to Open Society. This is where the colored tiers came in. It provided a lot more guidance and um, understanding for the public and how to operate. And then in January, 
they set up a statewide website called Safe Schools for All Hub. I really encourage everyone to find this website. There's so much information there. The California Department of Public Health has all of its updated guidance for schools. It, it also lays out the, um, all the data for which schools are in person, how many students are attending in distance learning or in person, and lots and lots of resources for parents, students, and for school communities. So um, on the vaccination front in San Mateo County, we focus first on our education workforce. We worked really closely with um, our uh, county health department and through the county office of education and our 23 local districts, we were able to get 11,000 members of our education workforce vaccinated within about three weeks. It was pretty phenomenal. Um, we used a, an equity distribution, taking our um, communities that had the highest rates of COVID um, in, in first in line. Um, and, you know, once, the, once this education workforce largely received their, um, their vaccinations, you started to see schools really start to open up a lot more interest and investment in trying to get back in person. So our educators, our teachers and our principals and our paraeducators are really feeling a lot more comfortable now that they're fully vaccinated. So next we focus on um, our students, um, the 12 to 17 year olds. Uh, we're working very hard on uh, encouraging them all to get vaccinated in San Mateo County. This is our current data for how many, as of uh, earlier in the week, how many um, individuals have been vaccinated in San Mateo County. If you count the 12 and older population, we're at 79.6%, but for the 12 to 15 year olds, we're about 35% of our 12 to 15 year olds have received their, their vaccinations, at least one shot. So we have a, a quite a ways to go, but they, they've, it's only been open to them, I think for two weeks. So um, we're working hard. Um, ah. One more forward. Um, so one thing we've been um, um, you know, wondering about at the county level is um, the, the public health officer um, is considering issuing a public health order authorizing youth ages 12 and up to consent to the COVID-19 vaccine on their own. It's called minor consent. This exists in other um, health conditions, especially around sexual health. And um, there is a sense that some kids may have trouble, you know, because their parents are busy or not understanding the, the systems or working multiple jobs, kids may have trouble accessing that consent from their parents. So there's a thought that um, having minor consent for this vaccine may help more kids get vaccinated. Um, we're using, certainly pushing Dr. Patel, the, you know, go to your, you know, your pediatrician first, if you can get your health checkup, you know, check in with your pediatrician, have them assure you what is necessary when you get your vaccination. Um, but we're also doing, there's lots of mobile clinics in San Mateo County. We're no longer doing the mass vaccination clinics because the numbers just aren't there anymore. Um, so we are partnering um, to do school-based events. And with schools, we're doing, um, so one of our big high school districts is um, hosting events and they're um, including all of their feeder districts. Um, so for the middle school kids are giving away free high school swag. So you can get a high school t-shirt of this, the, the, the school you're going to be going to, to help motivate kids to get excited and get on board with um, the vaccinations. Because the more kids are vaccinated, um, the more of our population, young population that's vaccinated, obviously, the more stable our school environments become. Because if not all the 12 year olds are vaccinated, there still can be cases of COVID in those classrooms and um, still may interrupt education in the fall. So San Mateo County on its uh, county health on its website has a full schedule of all the different clinics that are available. 
So there's plenty of opportunities. It's just a matter of getting the word out and getting people there and, and having um, folks feel comfortable overcoming any hesitancy they might have. Um, so in the meantime, schools are also very busy supporting mental health and well-being. There's a lot of, um, you know, we've been through tough times. Everyone's been through trauma and dysregulation and routines have been thrown off. So there's a lot of work going on in that area in our schools, working to achieve digital equity, still distributing school meals, providing childcare for staff um, because they're coming to work and their children's schools aren't fully in, in, um, in session. Uh, still navigating grades, graduation, um, and all the regular school business, getting our young people vaccinated. Um, sorry, our, my button's very touchy. Um, and then mapping out what's ahead, uh, the school year ahead, which by the way, everyone probably is wondering about. Um, one thing that's coming out of the governor's office is a little bit of extra money for the county offices of education and public health to continue to invest in our partnerships. Uh, these uh, relationships we built over the last year and a half have been amazing, really great practice for um, school leaders. I love our collaboration with our pediatricians led by Dr. Patel. I hope to continue that as we go forward. Um, and there's, so there's different ways we're thinking about using these funds um, to keep those partnerships going. And then looking ahead, as I said, schools are not going to have the flexibility to provide remote learning for families who are not yet comfortable coming to school in person. The requirement for public schools is going to be in-person learning. Um, there are a few side um, uh, small programs that may allow families to learn from home, but it's going to be very difficult for schools to support that. Um, so we are still planning on um, having all of our protocols in place. We know that we may have COVID cases in schools. And so we know how to do the um, contact tracing, what the quarantines are, you know, how to do the quarantines, um, educating our families about travel, where they travel to and when they come back to school. Masking will be really, really a big deal for um, schools coming into the fall. And then just remaining resilient. We're, I think most of this is behind us, the tough, tough, tough stuff is, but we still will have some challenges ahead. And so with all that we've learned, uh, there's so much learning that we've gained that I really think we can apply it forward into better systems for everybody, both in the way we serve our patients in healthcare and the way we serve students in education. So. Um, Hopefully that provided a little bit of glimpse into the future. It's a little bit of a crystal ball still. That was really helpful, Nancy. And thank you so much for reminding us of the hard work that um, all of the schools, the school districts, the teachers and, and all the staff, as well as the children have done um, over this past year uh, to learn. And you know, many of us are parents on here and have really seen the children thrive and are so, so appreciative. Okay, so uh, the questions have just been wonderful. Um, and I wanna send um, a couple of questions to you, Dr. Maldonado. You've answered some of them already, but what I've sensed from the Q&A is there's still lots of questions about masks, which is totally understandable because it's hard to know. So um, I wanna point out a few that I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about. So um, we had a parent of a young infant um, asking about, uh, you know, obviously the infant can't wear a mask and, and hasn't been vaccinated and hasn't yet been around um, a lot of people. So I was wondering if you could talk about both from how to wear a mask as well as developmentally. And then there were a few other questions I saw you answered um, around. I, I did answer that question, but I'll, I'll go over it. I thought maybe just talking about it a sure. little more would help. And then some questions about mixed status households with vaccinated and unvaccinated and, and things like that would be really helpful. Yeah, sure. So, um, so obviously uh, children under 12 uh, cannot be vaccinated at this time. And likely we won't have vaccines for children under 12 till at least the, the fall. 
Um, so those children um, are, are should, uh, and infants in any case, even if they're vaccinated, <laughs> wouldn't be able to wear a mask. So um, I, I think I said uh, that uh, I would allow a child who is unvaccinated, uh, an under, you know, an infant uh, who isn't masked to be around a fully vaccinated uh, individuals. And I think the current rules are that individuals indoors can have uh, household, two households um, included in their, um, in their in indoor setting without masking. And so that could be done. The, person, the people should not have any symptoms. And if they're going to uh, approach the infant, they should um, wash their hands and uh, bef before and after um, touching their faces and touching the child. And then regarding other household situations, currently vaccinated individuals can get together without masking or distancing indoors, and they can eat together as well. Um, and, and you can have a fully vaccinated group get together with one unvaccinated household. Um, provided that household doesn't have a high-risk individual, meaning somebody who, if they got infected, could um, have high risk for hospitalization. Great, thank you so much. I saw there was one other mask-related question that might be worthwhile. Summer is coming up, although we know kids are incredibly good at wearing masks. Um, you know, can they uh, play outside, um, you know, at camp and on play dates without masks? Yeah, I, I'm going to have to defer that to the different counties because there will be different rules. I know that, for example, uh, Governor Newsom has said that in June, on June 15th, we will go, we'll be completely open. <laughs> and I hope that that's the case, um, but we'll wait to have to see what Dr. Cody from Santa Clara County says and what other county health officers determine. Now, it is likely that fully vaccinated individuals will not have to wear masks. Now, again, 12 year olds and older uh, as well, but it's possible that for some situations, uh, there may need to be some masks. I, I just, I, I really, <laughs> I won't be able to know until the, the, the final guidelines come out. The crystal ball is not clear yet. Yeah. Um, I think the message is we all have to pay attention to our, our local yeah. guidelines. Absolutely. But I think in general, though, let me just give you some general thoughts, even though this is not the official thought, is that if you're outdoors and you're playing sports outdoors and you're not, you know, very close contact, um, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, outdoor games uh, like baseball, for example, I don't know about soccer, it depends on how, what the rules are for the soccer game. But anyway, things like that, um, definitely not basketball or football though. But if you played those games outside and even if you weren't vaccinated, I think in general, if you were outdoors, that could be reasonable. Uh, it's like, it may be likely that there could be allowances for that. I think for swimming, obviously you don't wear masks. Um, I guess the question is really things like indoor sports, like indoor basketball, indoor, um, other indoor sports, uh, what to do there. And uh, we'll just have to see what the guidance is. Great, thank you so much. So um, Dr. Bonilla, we have uh, several questions around variants and vaccine efficacy that I thought um, would be great if you could attend to. So one um, around um, the variants, there was a question, uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, if the tests are testing for all variants or could you test negative um, for COVID and perhaps have a different variant? In order to uh, find out the variant, you need to have the virus. So you need to virus, uh, isolate the virus and then try to sequence it. Try to see the different compounds of the virus, different kind of pieces of the chains to, and to identify the virus. If you have no virus, we can be able to sequence it then. So it's, we need to have a virus to sequence it. If we sequence the virus, we can identify according to the changes, what kind of variants we have. That's great. So the tests that are currently available test for all variants, essentially. The test that we are doing, for example, I go testing COVID positive. So the positive, so those strains, depends on the area, the state, or the hospital, or Stanford, they go and sequence it for looking for mutations. And then when they see the pattern of mutation, they come to have the variants. Is the UK variants, or is the California variants, or the Brazilian ones, or South Africa ones. 
depends on what kind of changes they find in the sequence of the virus. Thank you. And then could you answer some of the questions about um, the effectiveness of the vaccine over time? So how will people need to get booster shots? Um, is there a quote unquote expiration date of the vaccine? Um, can you answer some of those questions? Me, me or, or Bonnie? It's up, to, it's up to you. I was sending it to you. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Okay, so <laughs> the, I remember the, the virus can change over the time. So when the virus changes, maybe they could be resistant to different kind of variants. So time is going to tell. So, but we have now the technology that we can modify the vaccines because mRNA vaccine, we can modify the sequencing and adjust to those kind of changes. Like I'm going to happen with the influenza. Every year, we're going to have a different strain of the influenza. So we study the strain from the prior year, try to make the vaccine. So a situation like that is going to happen with coronavirus. So this is the reason to have the sequences over the time and see those changes very important to manufacture vaccines to cover those strains. Thank you so much. Uh, a question for you, Dr. Patel, that was submitted um, prior uh, was around breastfeeding and possible um, uh, uh, immunity for a breastfed infant if the parent is vaccinated. Yeah, so uh, you know, it, it always starts with the fact that breastfeeding is, is important. We encourage breastfeeding uh, and uh, a vaccine is uh, the COVID that you, you are, it is, we think safe to breastfeed with the COVID vaccine. And actually what I tell families, families is that um, the antibodies have been found in breast milk. Um, and so we think that that is helpful. Uh, we don't know necessarily that, 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 you know, we don't know how much immunity that gives to the child uh, or if it's enough, if it's an, enough to prevent illness. But just generally speaking, breastfeeding is a really great thing. And um, if you have um, uh, already gotten the vaccine or if you want to get it, we encourage you to do so. That's great. Um, there, thank you so much. There were um, other questions I noticed about trying to make decisions around travel. So an example question was, we want to take, a, take, out, take our family on a small group vacation to Alaska. Everyone will be masked, mostly outdoors. We have all had vaccinations and we'll test before we go, but the granddaughter is 11, so can't get vaccinated. Can you take her? That's just an example. There's other questions about travel, how, how to manage that this summer. Do you wanna take that Dr. Patel? <laughs> You're on mute. There you so go. So sorry. No Can problem. I just clarify that question? I um, didn't realize that it was going to me. Oh, I'm so um, sorry. So some questions about travel. So yeah. um, an example question. So people trying to make decisions about um, travel in the summer. An example question is we want to take our family on a trip to Alaska. Everyone will be masked, mostly outdoors. Everyone vaccinated except for the 11 year old daughter. Can she go? Yeah. So. Uh, the way that we've been sort of that I've been approaching that question is that as long when you aren't able to have one, uh, you know, the, the the mitigation or the protection of the vaccine, then you want to up the other protections, as suggested by the question, uh, to wear masks, to do to uh, to uh, distance physically, um, to have to, you know to be constantly washing your hands. Um, I do believe that it is um, uh, generally sa safe to travel. Um, it's helpful that everybody ar around um, uh, the unvaccinated child is, is um, vaccinated. And you basically want to sort of uh, keep, uh, minimize your contact uh, um, uh, with people. So I don't think it's fair to say, I don't, I wouldn't encourage just travel like no problem as if um, everybody is vaccinated pre-COVID style. Uh, but I think if that is something, it of course is a risk that if you're willing to take, um, the, you know, no, eliminating the risk would be not traveling. But I do think it's important for mental health and for um, uh, 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 the enjoyment uh, if, that if you wish to travel, then go ahead and do it, but just do it in a safe way. Thanks so much, Dr. Patel. 
Um, and Nancy, a question for you. There are some concerns of um, uh, among parents balancing the timeline of the vaccine availability with school start given the um, mandate from the, from the state around not having the um, distance learning options in the fall. Uh, what can you tell parents um, and kids about what school looks like and the safety of schools to help them uh, you know, feel better about the opening of schools in the fall? Yeah, so um, it's a great question. And, and we are doing everything we can to get our 12 to, to 17 year olds vaccinated before school starts. Um, for those who are younger, and we don't expect, um, I think, that to be um, those younger kids to have access to vaccine until the fall. Um, but in the meantime, um, we have, we had eight or nine school districts fully in person uh, most of this last school year um, from September or October all the way through June. Um, op, um, practicing physical distancing, wearing masks, hand washing. And um, based on the number of students, classrooms and staff we had in school, we really had very few incidences of COVID-19 in the school community. And when we did, it was identified quickly and, and early and did not result in transmission. So um, I do believe that we had been talking from the very beginning that masking is one of the most effective ways of reducing the transmission of the virus. And so um, with students masking, and again, schools are under very, a lot of scrutiny. So there's a lot of eyes on to make sure that everybody's following the rules. And we have, we have very clear guidelines in San Mateo County. Um, and our superintendents have been very committed to following those guidelines. So we've had great success with students in person, in school, even before the vaccine was available to adults. Um, so I think we have to remember that we, we have a track record of success. Thank you so much, Nancy. I think um, I can agree as someone on the other side, a parent with children in schools, that there's been an incredible amount of success and how well teachers and students have done with the uh, uh, distancing and, and masking every day has been quite surprising. So with only five minutes left, I wanna put out a question to each of the panelists and we'll just go around uh, the room and get your last comments. Um, so each of you has been incredibly active in the pandemic response. I'm surprised any of you has had time to sleep over the last uh, 15 months with all that has been happening. Um, so in addition to showing our gratitude for that, uh, we'd like to know what's one thing you're looking forward to um, for, the, for the fall or maybe the summer in terms of the pandemic response. Uh, so let's see, Dr. Maldonado, you can can go first. Um, I am suspecting that pediatric vaccine <laughs> approvals is one expectation, but we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I'm really excited to see the vaccines available for children. I want to see the kids go back to school um, as much as possible. And I thank you so much, Supervisor McGee, for all of your, uh, your work. Um, it is uh, heroic. And I know it's not easy. So, uh, but I think the vaccines are going to help a lot. I mean, I truly agree that you can do it without the vaccine, but certainly the vaccines make it so much easier. So I am really grateful. Um, I just, I don't have it here on my desk, but I just picked up a book called Extra, Extra Life. It's reviewed in the New York Times. It's written by a Harvard psychologist named Stephen Johnson. And it's about the fact that since 1920, so a hundred years ago, we've doubled our life expectancy. And we've doubled it with things like simple things that we don't really like to think about, like toilets, sewers, fluorination, pasteurization, vaccines, antibiotics. And um, it, the, we're not talking about the big glitzy, shiny things. We're talking about the basic hard work that all of you here are doing. Um, and so these are the things that have doubled our lifespans. 
So we need to keep doing them. And I'm super excited that we're going to get to keep doing them for our children. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Maldonado. Uh, Dr. Bonilla, you're next. What are you hopeful for? Yes, I, I hopeful for um, get out therapeutics, try to uh, people getting infected to treat them. I'm, I'm very worried about the long-term complications of this virus that have been like an overlook. And so we need to do everything in our hands, try to get them vaccinated as a preventive measurement of infections. And hopefully everybody come to the census and work together as a single country to fight this problem. Thank you so much, wonderful. Okay, Dr. Patel, uh, your hopes. Yeah, my hopes for the fall. So I, I would have to say um, with my two boys is uh, I'm really excited about them going back to school. I'm also excited to, um, uh, what I'm really looking forward is the element of uh, fear that we dealt with and, and just the sacrifice that um, everybody did um, and experienced um, over the last year. I'm looking for that to come down a little bit um, so that we can really, um, ultimately, I can't wait to really celebrate my patients and my family and um, everybody I know um, as we sort of slow down our pace and really look back and see that despite all the hardships that, and there were many, um, that uh, I think that I'm really looking forward to celebrating um, uh, the resilience that they demonstrated. And I think in the, in, in, the, in kids sake, uh, or, or for kids, this is something that will, that will, uh, that they can carry with them for a lifetime. It is amazing to think for children, uh, the way this will mark their childhood. Yes. Okay, Superintendent uh, McGee, can you share your hopes for the fall? Sure, I can't wait to get on school campuses and hear those kids laughing and playing and talking and um you know so that's the personal thing but but to you know to tag off of what dr patel said i really want um i'm really encouraging our schools to have um them welcome back their students uh asking them to tell their stories um to share what the experience has been like because there's been really special joyful experiences where we've been closer as family and kind of a smaller, simpler life um, in, in a way. And we've also been through so much and kids have really seen, uh, experienced real sacrifice and experienced loss and how to transition and change routines. And they've gained so much wisdom and, and long, you know, life building skills that it would be really great for them to be able to share um, their wisdom as they come back together in community and schools. It's wonderful and a wonderful note to end on. I hope we all get an opportunity to do that and how wonderful for the children to be able to do that in the fall, hopefully with much of this in their rear view mirror. I wanna thank each of the panelists, uh, not just for your uh, contribution of time today, but all the work that you have done over these last 15 months and before. Uh, during the pandemic and, and everything else. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you so much to the attendees for coming. We wouldn't do this without you and we really appreciate your questions. So thank you so much. Good night.